What's up guys and gals? We are here with part one of what is going to be a three-part series on program design. I call it the Program Design Chronicles. What I'm really hoping you guys get out of this is that you have a resource that you can look back to, that you can learn from, so that when you sit down to write your own programming, or maybe you're sitting down to write out some programming for your clients, you have something that you can look at and say, all right, What's the first step? What's the second step? How do I kind of lay all this out to make the most succinct and most effective and evidence-based program possible? Let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it. Alrighty, so <clears throat> step one of sitting down to write down any program. I don't care who it's for. I don't care if it's for grandma. I don't care if it's LeBron James. I don't care if it's Ronnie Coleman. When we sit down to write a program, step number one is always going to be the needs analysis. And the needs analysis is exactly what it sounds like. It's where you, as the coach, sit down and analyze the need, not only of the individual, but of the sport as well. So you can see that in the first bullet point right there. It says that a needs analysis is a two-step process. Step number one is you want to evaluate the individual's goals, and the demands of the sport. And the goals of an athlete are usually to excel at the sport. So for something like basketball, the goals of basketball would be that I need to run faster, I need to jump higher, I need to improve my jump shot so that I can score more points, I can play better defense, I can contribute to the team more. But when we get into more of a subjective sport like bodybuilding, which will be the scope of this um, presentation here, we need to look at what are the demands of the sport of bodybuilding. They're a lot easier. On game day or on show day, you need to show up with the most musculature, you need to be as symmetrical as possible, and you need to have great conditioning. It's more subjective than an objective sport like powerlifting where you show up, you lift the most weight, you win. So there are some nuances that we have to deal with, some small details that we need to contend with when doing a needs analysis for a bodybuilder. And it starts by number one, saying, all right, what's the individual's goal? You're gonna get a lot of bodybuilders, a lot of competitors that come to you and they say, I just wanna do a show, just wanna do a show. I wanna be competitive, okay? That's your goal. And there are others that say, I wanna win my pro card, I wanna win Mr. Olympia, and the needs of those two athletes are very, very different. The local show individual and the Mr. Olympia competitor, very, very different needs in their training and they need to be addressed appropriately. Now we can move on and we can assess the athlete. We've determined what their goals are, we've determined where they wanna to get to, and now we can say, all right, what is the athlete's current status? Uh, current status, I look at my Mr. Olympia hopeful and he is 165 pounds, 20% body fat. Okay, current status, uh, not great. Leaves a lot for improvement. And then you can say, what are the future needs to be competitive? And to establish or determine what are the future needs to be competitive, look at the level of competition that the individual wants to get to. If you say, I wanna win Mr. Olympia, you should stack your picture next to Mr. Olympia. Make the most direct comparison that you possibly can. Now this gets a little different because people are built differently. There's different, the, the judging changes. It's, it's, again, it's very subjective. But if you want to be Mr. Olympia, you're going to have to look like Mr. Olympia. So stack those two together, see where you currently stand, and then we can start to devise a plan of how you're gonna get there. In bodybuilding, it's a matter of looking at where are you currently well-developed and what body parts might be lagging. You look at an athlete, they send you good check-in photos for your first time together. You see they've got these massive quads, lagging hamstrings, a well-developed chest and arms. Boom, immediately you can start to run some ideas in your head of what their training is going to look like because you know where they're good, you know where they're ahead of the ball game, and you know where they're a little bit behind. In powerlifting, our objective sport, or one of our objective sports here, it's a lot easier. Say, all right, what's your squat bench and your deadlift? And what is the squat and the bench and the deadlift of an individual who competes at the level that you want to compete at? I want to, I want to win a local meet, local powerlifting meet. Okay, I look up the numbers from last year's local meet that you want to enter. Here are the numbers that won. Those are the numbers that we're going to shoot for. I want to compete at the national level, the international level. I want to set world records or American records, whatever it is. 
then you have some numbers that you know that you need to shoot for. But you can always start, or you always start with, where are you? And where do you need to get to? Because that's where we develop our plan. In weightlifting, it's very similar to powerlifting. You're just gonna say, all right, where is your current snatch and clean and jerk? And then what level do you wanna compete at? Local, national, international, Olympic. Um, and then you just kind of build out the training based off how far you need to get. In team sports, there's a lot of different characteristics, a lot of different athletic attributes that we're looking to train. So we wanna identify the actual sport. So a sport like water polo is very different than a sport like sumo wrestling. Those both emphasize very different athletic characteristics. So you wanna to train to the athletic characteristics of the sport, things like speed, agility, quickness, uh, strength, power, all of those kind of things. And then you build those into your training plan accordingly. We won't get into team sports or weightlifting or powerlifting much. We're just going to stick to uh, pretty much bodybuilding or hypertrophy style training here. Up next, one of the biggest predictors of someone who's not going to go very far in a sport is someone who often gets injured. The more time you spend injured, the more time you're spending away from training. So part of being a great bodybuilder is just staying healthy so that you can string together enough productive training to achieve your goals. Because if you're constantly dealing with back, knee, elbow, this, that, and the other, it's taking away from your training. You're losing valuable weeks, months, and years of training that by the end of your career, when you've missed that prime period for growth, all of a sudden you've got no room left in your career for growth because you were injured for so long. So establish what are the most common injuries in the sport. And for bodybuilding, it's pretty easy. They're overuse injuries. It's tendonitis, uh, tendinopathy, whatever you want to call it, of in the elbow, in the knees, um, you get some bodybuilders who get jacked up backs. So you wanna know how to deal with those and often the best treatment plan there is to just reduce the amount of load or reduce the amount of volume that the individual is doing, let the area calm down and then come back to it because those small little chronic overuse injuries um, can actually turn into one of these very large, acute, catastrophic career ending injuries. Now, when we move over to like team sports, there's a bit of both. There's the chronic, the overused stuff, and then there's the acute injuries as well. So chronic overuse might be a shoulder impingement in a volleyball player because they're constantly going through that movement. Whereas um, in soccer, we see the ACL tear um, being our most common, uh, or not chronic, but acute injury, especially in women. But again, leaving team sports alone. We don't want to deal with team sports right now. Um, when we assess the athlete, so moving further in our assessment of the athlete, we want to look at their training age. And what I did is I put a graphic here from the NSCA, the CSCS prep textbook, and it talks about resistance training background. And if you, if you read any research, any hypertrophy research, any training research, you'll often see uh, the subjects were beginners, they were intermediates, they were advanced. And they usually use a chart or something like this to identify that. But I put a little disclaimer, a little qualifier next to training age. There's, you need to differentiate when you're talking about training age versus time. So time is how long you've been training. I've been training personally myself since I was, uh, how old was I? 15. I am about to be 28 now. So I've got almost 13 years of resistance training. That would be my training time. However, a lot of that time was spent dicking around, doing stupid training. So within that first year, so let's say I exceeded my first year, I was 16, I had a year of resistance training under my belt. The NSCA would say, you're advanced now, but I had been doing terrible training programs, so was I actually advanced? Looking back, I would argue no, I wasn't. So when you, start, when you establish someone's training status, you wanna look at how long have been, they been training productively, intelligently and in an evidence-based manner before you look at, or instead of looking at just how long, how many years have you been in the gym? So there's a difference between your training time and your actual training status. You also want to look at the individual's training experience. So I know that I have a question on my intake form that talks about what kind of training have you done in the past? Have you been doing the bro split? Have you been training full body every day? Have you been training one or two days a week? Have you been doing like CrossFit classes? Have you been doing Orange Theory classes? I want to know what kind of training programs you are coming to me from. 
That way I know how to adjust the training. Because if you're coming to me from an Orange Theory fitness background, I can't just throw you into a high volume resistance training program because you'll get so beat up that it just won't be productive. So what kind of training programs have they been doing and what kind of exercises have they been doing? That's also very, very important because if you are very dogmatic and attached to a certain series of exercises, let's say you are a bodybuilding coach who has a powerlifting background and you love yourself some squats some bench and some deadlift. Some individuals are going to come to you with zero and I genuinely mean zero experience in the squat, the bench, and the deadlift. But you, Captain Dogma, are like, you have to squat, bench, and deadlift to grow. And they're like, I don't know how. And you're like, well, just fucking do it anyway. That's poor training advice. So that's poor coaching advice. You want to say, all right, what exercises have you done before? And as we get further on to the presentation, we'll see why that matters. Well, let's move it along. Further along into our assessment of the athlete, we want to do some sort of physical testing. On the left here, I included a table that looks at some physical testing for a basketball player, an elite male basketball player. You can see things like age, height, weight, their 10 meter sprint times, uh, some agility tests like the T-drill, uh, their counter movement jump, and even things like estimated VO2 max. Now, in this list right here, and I'll give you a second to think about this. How many matter for a, how many of these matter for a bodybuilder? What do you think? How many of these variables actually matter? Let's go down the list and let's say uh, gender. Yeah, that matters. Age. Yeah, that matters. Height. Yeah, especially if they're in a division that's dictated by height. Body mass. Yeah, got to know how much they weigh. Body fat. It's important, know how lean they are, know what their starting point is. 10 meter sprint, no, not so much. Counter movement jump, no, definitely not. T drill test, doesn't matter. VO2 max, I gotta do some cardio, but none of it's gonna be very high intensity or close to VO2 max, so that doesn't matter. But what if there was something like 1RMs on here? What if this had like a 1RM squat, bench, deadlift? Would that be valuable information for a bodybuilder. I think there are two camps here. Some would say yes, some would say no. So those who tend to program off of absolute intensity, they wanna know these 1RM values. Those who program more on the repetitions and reserve or RPE side would probably be more inclined to say, no, a 1RM test doesn't really matter that much. It's not really providing us with any valuable information. My thoughts about a 1RM for a bodybuilder is that it's information. No information is bad information, but am I going to use a 1RM or have a bodybuilder go out of their way to test their 1RM in compound movements? Absolutely not. It is, if we look at the risk reward there of what you gain and what the risk is, it is very, very shifted high risk, low reward, because you're not going to use that in your programming. So I used to be someone who valued the 1RM, but now I've moved more away from that, where it just doesn't really provide me with as much information as I'd like it to. So what about sports like a barbell sport? What about like powerlifting or weightlifting? Then are 1RMs important? Hell yes, they are. They're extremely important. So in the objective sports where we need to know, you're a basketball player. What's your vertical jump? Your vertical jump is six inches? You can barely even get off the ground and you're supposed to be getting rebounds? No chance, we gotta improve that. So the more objective the sport becomes where we can actually quantify the result with numbers, the more the numbers play into it. But remember, in bodybuilding, it's all about building your body. It doesn't matter how you got that great physique or what your 1RM is or how strong your grip is or anything like that. It just matters that you have the physique. So if you are doing some physical testing of your bodybuilders, your competitors, just make sure it's physical testing where you can actually use the values uh, or the numbers that you get to benefit the training. So. The only real physical testing, if it even counts as physical testing, that I use for my bodybuilders on their way in is, can you guess? It's pictures, so just some check-in pictures. So we can either go in the poses or just some relaxed pictures so we can see, all right, what body parts do we need to improve? The next step in the needs analysis, and it's our final step here, is setting realistic expectations. 
So a lot of clients are gonna come to you with absolutely insane expectations or crazy goals, and it's your job to reel those in and set realistic expectations. I mean, how many times have you had it happen where a client comes to you and they say, I wanna look like Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Like, okay, what do you look like now? I'm five foot two, 135 pounds, soaking wet. Now, if you were a scumbag, you'd be like, oh yeah, we'll get you there. We'll get you there in six months if you pay $12,000 for this new special program that I wrote. But don't be a scumbag. Nobody likes a scumbag. Frame realistic expectations. How do I phrase it? I phrase it like so. It's a great goal. We're gonna train like we are going to reach that goal. We are going to train as if we are going to reach that goal, but we have to train within the realm of your genetics. So we're gonna shoot for it. We're gonna land at something very impressive that you're pleased with, but you might not be the next WWE superstar. Sorry. So when you do sit down to make those realistic expectations, you wanna go through a couple things, a couple questions that need to be answered. Number one is where is the client at in their career? And what I mean by that is going back to training age is what's their training age? A beginner with lofty goals, hell yeah, set huge goals because you've never trained before, you're a beginner, we have no idea how much you can actually accomplish. Let's set huge goals and let's do everything we can to achieve those because we really might get there. Or is it a situation where the individual is a 20 year veteran in the iron game? They've been a natural bodybuilder, they've been competing for 20 years, and they come to you and they say, hey, I wanna put on 10 pounds of muscle for my next show. You're like, well, I've got some bad news for you there, cause that just ain't gonna happen. So know what to expect out of a training program based off of where's the client at in their career. Step number two that you want to answer is that, is this individual enhanced or natural? So again, the natural individual, as they get further into their career, they experience diminishing returns like crazy. Whereas the enhanced individual can kind of push those returns a little bit further for a little bit longer. That's not to say there's this humongous difference between enhanced or natural. And the, the analogy that I always give is that competing naturally or training naturally is like driving a Toyota Prius. You push the gas pedal, you go. You push the brake, you slow down. But it's overall, it's a pretty slow process. It's a pretty slow car. But... It's quite safe and you can do it for a very, very long time. Whereas being enhanced, especially if you really, really push the dosages very, very high, um, it's more like driving a Ferrari where you push the gas, it goes, you push the brake, it slows down, you still have to change gears and all of that. It's still the same rules as driving a car. You can just go a lot faster, but with that speed comes risk. So we're still driving a car in both examples. Just one, you can go a lot faster, and two, you have to set a realistic expectation that you're going to be going a bit slower. The third point that I wanted to make here, and it's kind of like a special point here, is that as you get later into your career, it's a really good idea to start using specialization cycles. When individuals come to me and they're very early in their career, they've been training for a year or two years, whatever it is, and they say, hey, I've got lack, my, my biceps are lacking, or I need to bring up my upper chest. That's an example, or that's, an, that's, that's a situation where you don't really wanna get into any specialization cycles because that individual is so early in their career and primed for growth that they can continue to push their training extremely hard, grow everywhere, and then after four or five years, then you can say, all right, let's start doing some specialization cycles to bring up your lacking body parts. But don't get into that mental trap where you think you have to do specialization cycles to bring up your arms or stress your, or, or improve your hamstrings, things like that early on in your career. You wanna take advantage of those early stages of just maximal growth. All right, that is the needs analysis. Step one, mm, put a pin in it, it's done. Step number two, what are we gonna do next in our program? Exercise selection. Now we can start to pick some exercises. And people usually skip straight to this, or they skip straight to frequency or volume, which are gonna be things that we talk about in, in later editions of this series. Start with that needs analysis. Always, 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 always. Basket weaver or bodybuilder, we always start with a needs analysis. Step number two, now we can start picking exercises. 
But when we pick our exercises, we have some very, very important questions to answer. And each question here is going to get its own slide. So we'll run through these pretty quick. What are the demands of the sport? Are you like Dmitry Klokov right here, an Olympic weightlifter, or you need to be extremely good at the snatch and the clean and jerk? Then most of your training should be focused around the snatch and the clean and jerk. Are you a bodybuilder where you win by having the largest muscles? Then the majority of your training should be geared towards building your muscles as large as possible and as symmetrical as possible. Question number two, what is the exercise technique experience of the athlete? This gets back to people who think that squats and benches and deadlifts are the best exercises that you can possibly do for hypertrophy. Well, what if you get a client who's never done those before? How does the exercise technique experience of the individual affect your training, especially in those early stages? What kind of equipment is available? This is a huge one right here. So where are they actually training at? We'll, we'll talk about this extensively. What do they have access to? Because you want to frame your exercise selection around things that the client actually has access to. That makes sense, right? Number four is how much training time is available. So if you've got very little time available, you wanna choose exercises that have high bang for your buck. If you've got more time available, then you can start to get into the, the fine details and kind of fine tune things a little bit if you've got more time to play with. So you're really running between, with, with time, you're really running between two concepts here. If you're low on time, you wanna be as efficient as possible. If you're not low on time, you wanna be as optimal as possible. So optimality versus efficiency is gonna be dictated by how much time the individual has to give you. And then the last question is something that you should obviously know about all of your clients. Where are the pre-existing injuries? What are the limitations? And the athlete preferences. Athlete preferences is a big one here because if you write out the perfect program and it's uh, you got front squats in there because you love front squats and you've got the perfect percentages or RPE, RIR progressions, whatever it is, load progression, stuff like that. Everything is perfect. And the client says, I hate front squat. I won't do it. Now, now look at how much time you've wasted writing out that. So you wanna know, hey, front squat, you good with those? No, nah, I can't do front squat because I don't have the wrist mobili mobility for it. Cool, we're gonna work on your wrist mobility and in the meantime, we'll do back squats instead. And if the client is all gravy with that, then you progress with back squat. Don't get super committed to or fall in love with one exercise and think it's the best. But let's, let's look at these questions a little bit deeper one by one. All right, demands of the sport. We're talking about demands of the sport, we're talking about bodybuilding here. So we're not talking about team sports, we're not talking about powerlifting, we're not talking about weightlifting. The objective sports are, are, are a lot easier to program for. Um, with bodybuilding, we wanna look at, I wanna choose exercises that cause the maximal amount of growth in these specific muscles where I need that growth as well as possible. So that's what we're looking for here. So what do I choose? Do I choose compound or do I choose isolation exercises? Most people will say, oh, you choose the compound movements. You stress the most muscles, you can use the highest load, therefore you get the greatest overload. Somewhat true, but missing some details there. Now, what if you've got someone who you've got them programmed to do squats, they come to you and they say, coach, loving the squats, getting a lot stronger, I'm progressing, but I feel the squat a lot more in my lower back than I feel it in my quads. So you kind of think back and you say, all right, well, this is an individual who has weak quads or, or lagging quads. We need to improve their quads. And they, you've got them doing back squat to achieve that goal, but they're telling you, I feel it in my lower back instead of my quads. You've got two possible things that you can do here. Can one, look at their technique, and you definitely should. Their technique is probably off if they're feeling it more in their back than they are their quads. If their technique looks fine, maybe back squat just isn't the best exercise for them. Switch them over to a leg press, and then they text you a couple days later, and they're like, I switched over to leg press, and my quads were absolutely lit up. I was sore, I had a good pump in my quads, and you're like, sweet. All right, leg press it is instead of squat. Because even though the pump and muscle damage or muscle soreness aren't good predictors of hypertrophy. They are a fantastic predictor of the fact that you worked the targeted muscle. So if I do squats and my quads don't hurt at all, no pump whatsoever, and I do leg press and I'm sore, 
in my quads and I get a huge pump in my quads, what does that mean? It means that I'm using my quads a lot more in the leg press than I am the squat. So bang for your buck isn't just about what exercise can you move the most weight in for hypertrophy training. It's a, it's a lot about where do you actually feel the exercise the most as well. Structural versus power exercise, high versus low axial load exercises. We're really getting into some, some terminology there that for the scope of this presentation on bodybuilding, doesn't matter as much. Why I mentioned these is that a lot of these exercises, the high versus low axial load, the structural and the power exercises, you really wanna look at what's the fatigue that's incurred? How fatiguing is this exercise? And then how much hypertrophy do I get out of it? I believe Mike Isratel calls this the st stimulus fatigue ratio. So how much do you stimulate the muscle and then how much, do you, how much fatigue does your body feel from it? It's a good term, I like that term. Um, you gotta remember the goal here. Remember the goal, remember the goal. The goal is to grow the quadriceps and you feel your quads working a lot more doing a leg extension than a squat. Stick with that leg extension instead of the squat. Um, Dexter Jackson has a really good interview where he talks about Ronnie Coleman and Ronnie Coleman is, Ronnie Coleman is a classic example of someone who really loaded up the compound exercises quite heavily, um, had huge muscles and everyone always uses him as the example of, well, look at Ronnie's quads and look how heavy he squatted. Well, Dexter Jackson's quads aren't exactly small and he's done machines for most of his career and look how long he's stuck around in the sport and how much success it's brought him, whereas Ronnie Coleman is in a wheelchair. Now, don't get me wrong. Your boy loves the clanging and banging 800 for two at, I don't even know, I think it was like six weeks out from the Olympia. That is a great video. I love that video of Ronnie Coleman. However, was it the smartest training? Hell no, it was not the smartest training, but it is a badass video. If Ronnie Coleman had bodybuilded in the Instagram era, woo, buddy, that man would have been very famous. He would have gotten likes, views, out the booty. All right, let's reel it back in. Let's kind of get back to the presentation. So remember the goal. If you want to bring up the quads, arms, whatever it is, choose an exercise that you feel actually in that muscle group. Makes sense. Um, Sport-specific exercise selection is a little different. So you want to look at different uh, performance metrics. So are you working with a sprinter? Or are you working with a basketball player? A basketball player has a high demand in the, the vertical force vector, whereas the sprinter has a high demand in the horizontal force vector. So you want to choose exercises that match that, a front squat for the basketball player, maybe a hip thrust for the sprinter, stressing the correct musculature at the correct joint angles, producing force at the correct uh, position or in, in the right angle. With bodybuilding, it's all about Muscle balance, symmetry, development, accentuate those strengths and hide your weaknesses. So choose your exercises based off of that. Now, experience of the athlete is also extremely important. I took this straight out of the CSCS text. It says that do not assume that an athlete will ever perform an exercise correctly. It's, it's a depressing quote, but it's also hilarious and it's also very true. And if you've ever personal trained, either in a one-on-one -on -one setting or an online setting, you know that if you give an athlete an exercise that they've never done before and you don't cue them up a lot, Sometimes they're doing cleans and they look like this fella right here where the elbows are pointing straight at the ground, the bar isn't even touching the clavicles, the feet are all over the place. They'll do it wrong. If you give them the chance to, they will. So when the athlete hasn't done the exercise before, you wanna really be on your best coaching behavior. You wanna cue using everything that you have. You wanna use the visual. So the visual cueing is gonna be here. Watch me while I do it. The next visual cue that you're gonna use is, I'm gonna film you while you do it. And you're gonna watch, watch the film, say, oh, hey, here you, you broke the hips instead of the knees, or you didn't finish your extension, whatever it may be. You can also use physiological cues. Tell the athlete what it's supposed to feel like. All right, you're, when you descend in the squat, you're gonna break at the hips and the knees at the same time. Um, you're gonna descend straight down and try and put your butt cheeks in between your ankles, something like that, if you were cueing a high bar squat. Those are all physiological cues of what it should feel like. And then you can give some audible feedback as well while they're performing the movement. Um, Classic audible feedback that everyone always makes fun of is uh, like for equipped powerlifters when they're doing a squat and you hear someone in the background just screaming back, 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 back. That would be an example of audible feedback where they're telling the individual to sit back, sit back, sit back. 
Um, one thing I would caution about audible feedback when you are queuing is keep it simple, especially for your beginner athletes. Um, and then I get it. And then I've got some so on the next bullet points here. I've got some some examples uh, of some hypotheticals. So if you've got a short period of time with a client, so let's say client comes to you one on one setting. They're like, hey, um, my old coach was a real D bag. Um, I'm coming to you. So can you get me ready for this show? And they look pretty good. And, and you're sitting down to write their exercise program out. Um, and you say, hey, uh, Jimmy, you ever done a, a front squat before? No, I've never done a front squat before. How about leg press? Oh, I love leg press. Do it all the time. What exercise are you going to choose in that scenario? Well, you could say the front squat is a squat, so it's better for the quads. It's going to grow the quads more, and that's what Jimmy's going to do. He's going to do the front squat, even though he's never done it before. Or are you going to choose the leg press because he's used to that? You've got a short period of time, so you don't have a lot of time to teach him or coach him. And my question back to you, if you do choose the back squat or the front squat over the leg press is, is a barbell back squat that much better in a short period of time than a leg press? Especially if one, the leg press is done correctly, and two, the barbell back squat is not done correctly. Choose the exercise that the individual can do correctly, come back and teach when you've got more time. So again, another example of why it can be very dangerous to be dogmatic about your exercise selection. Moving along, the next two are pretty quick, pretty easy here. So equipment and time. So equipment is all about where are they working out. Your Globo gyms, your LA Fitness, your Gold's Gym, um, any of these big name gyms that you can think of, they're gonna have every piece of equipment that you could possibly need. You can pretty much go gangbusters with the program that you wanna write out in terms of choosing exercises. And then as we move down here, you're gonna see that we get a little bit harder and harder to write out a program. So what I call the 24 hour rinky dinks, which are like the Planet Fitness, some of these older 24 hour anytime fitnesses, they don't have a lot of equipment. They're limited in dumbbells. Maybe they don't have barbells. Maybe they only have certain machines. In that scenario, you're gonna have to either visit the gym yourself or get some pictures of the gym before you sit down to write out uh, the exercises because you're not gonna have as much equipment. Powerlifting gym, so now we're gonna get into the specialties. So powerlifting gym, CrossFit box, weightlifting club, home gym, whatever it may be. My suggestion here is that you should train to the discipline at the gym that you are going to. If you wanna be a bodybuilder, go to a bodybuilding globo gym style gym where you have a lot of equipment available to you so that you can use or take advantage of all of that. If you're going to a powerlifting gym, powerlift. CrossFit box, compete in CrossFit, weightlifting. You get what I'm saying here. Um, don't limit yourself just because, oh, I wanna go to a CrossFit box, but I wanna be a bodybuilder. You're just intentionally limiting yourself on what you can get out of your program. Sign up at the correct gym so you can get the most out of your training program. Last, and we're gonna to touch on this when we touch on frequency in the next part, um, is availability and time is gonna dictate frequency and your training split. So in the next part, tune into that one, we're gonna talk about things like two days per week, three days per week, four, greater than five, what we can actually do in terms of training split and what we should do based on frequency. So I'll just barely touch on that here and kind of how exercise selection goes into that. But next time, we're gonna talk a lot more about that. So what's up next? I kind of already gave it away. In the next part, part two, Come back, we're gonna talk about training frequency and then how to order your exercises. Thank you for tuning in. As always, subscribe to our YouTube, follow us on Instagram. We are at Gifted Performance on all social media platforms. Request to join the Facebook group. We are always posting good articles, having good discussions in that Facebook group. Join giftedperformance.com. $30 a month, that gets you automated coaching. That's access to 15 of our training programs as well as macronutrient coaching. If that's not enough for you or you wanna take it one step further, your goals are more advanced, apply to work with one of our one-on-one -on -one coaches. We've got coaches that work with powerlifters, weightlifters, bodybuilders, general fitness, 
you want to lose five pounds, things like that, as well as some return to training specialists. So we've got two DPTs on staff that if you've got shoulder pain, knee pain, back pain, whatever it is, you can set up a consultation with them and they will help you get back to training as fast as possible. Need to improve your posing for your next bodybuilding competition? We've also got two posing, a male and a female posing coach on staff as well. That is the end of my rambling, the end of my shameless plug. You guys know the drill. Stay gifted, and I'm going to see you on the next one. See ya.